Um, let's get to the... Why do I love God's holidays? Listen, guys. If, if, if I make an appointment with you, I'm going to show. If I tell you I'm going to be there at 10 o'clock, I'm going to be there when I tell you, pretty much. When God makes an appointment, do you think he's not going to show? I mean, think about it. God has appointments. He goes, I want you to celebrate Purim. You think he's not going to show? Why do you think on God's holidays there's like his presence on steroids? Why do you have to figure it out? Why do you have to look at it legalistically? Why do you have to find out everything that the Jews did on the holiday? It says celebrate. You don't know how to celebrate? You don't know how to just read the story and celebrate? This, this is a joyous day. This isn't a day we talk about this one being sick or this one. Not today. No, this is a celebration, man. You've got to find days to celebrate in the Lord. I mean, I, I meet a bunch of sorry believers. It's like, I don't want to join your club. And you want me to give an offering on top of it so I could be sad too? No. Purim is one of the happiest holy days on the Jewish calendar. Bar none. Haman was an ancient Persian forerunner of Hitler. He plotted to kill all the Jews. The lawyer foiled his plan and saved the Jews from this really would-be mass murderer. There's no other way to describe him. It's all he was. Aside from the Torah, Esther is the Bible's best-known book among non-Jews. It's the Torah and the book of Esther. Purim relates how, I'm sure you've read the story tons of times, Esther is drafted into King Ashaviris' beauty contest. All the while, at a cousin Mordecai's directive, keeping her religious origins a secret. There's a time for everything under the sun. Listen to me. I love some of you, but your timing is so way off it's pathetic. God, forgive me. But there is a time. Some of you hear something from God and tell that person. You weren't supposed to tell that person. That was for you alone. There's things I tell Max that aren't for Shana. Is it secret? I have a relationship with him. I have a relationship with Shana. God has a relationship with each one of you. Before you spew stuff you hear, why don't you check with the boss to see if it's appropriate? And timing, it ha you can't do the right thing at the wrong time. It's not possible. Everything has a destiny. When God's promises intersect his timing, that's destiny. But destiny can't come to fruition till the right time. Got to have your timing down, Pat. A short time after this, Esther wins this beauty contest and marries the king. Mordecai infuriates Ashverus' most powerful advisor by refusing to bow before him. Daniel did the same thing. These were righteous men. They weren't like, hey, I only bow to God. That wasn't their attitude. They said, no offense, king. This is my faith. This is what I tell everybody when I meet them. Muslims, whatever. Jews, this is my faith. I met one of the chief rabbis at this museum I'll tell you about another day. He has all the biblical animals in this museum. It was me, him, and his coworker. I told him up front, hey, I'm messianic. If you don't want to talk to me, that's fine but I'm not hiding my faith. I'm not hiding. I am not ashamed. I will never be ashamed of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Never. Hallelujah. You can forget it. So obviously, Haman considers it beneath his dignity to wreak vengeance just on Mordecai. You know, let's concoct a plan to wipe out all the Jews. He was using arguments that have remained part of the arsenal of anti-Semites Ever since. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about how important it is to embrace the Jewish people. Not Israel. There are people in love with Israel who give a crap about the Jews. They go to Israel and they go, ooh, maybe this is an olive tree that Yeshua stood under. Yeshua cursed the olive tree. Yeshua died for people, not a nation. It's not about the land or the sea, but the dwelling of His majesty. King Ashaviris gives in to Haman's plan. Both of them are unaware that Esther is a Jew. When the news of Haman's plot surfaces, Mordecai urges Esther to intervene with the king. Her first instinct is to refuse. Rightfully so, guys. We could talk about this all day long, but in the heat of the battle, I mean, I know guys, Delta Force guys, I know them, three guys from the Delta Force watch. Their training is second to none. But when bullets are flying overhead, it's a different ballgame. You know what I'm saying? Targets don't shoot back. 
boards don't hit back. It's a different story when you're in the thick of it. So here she is. She informs her cousin, look, this is a capital crime. And to boot, he hasn't summoned her for 30 days, which means she might have pissed him off. It's possible. He has nothing to do with her for a whole month. So it's not looking good, right? But she concedes. Mordecai persists, and she gives in. Even more than Pharaoh, Haman becomes for the Jews the symbol of the Jew hater, the would-be Hitler of his day. That is why retaliation carried out against him is so satisfying. I can't wait till the devil's thrown into the pit. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. <laughs> Esther goes to Ashaviris and succeeds in turning him against this evil advisor. Haman is hanged from the very gallows he set up. And Esther and the Jewish people are saved and live happily ever after. Jews are commanded, my people are commanded to hear the public reading, a whole reading of the scroll of Esther, called the Megillah of Esther. All day long, they're supposed to do this. Are they doing this? Nope. Not many. It's a reminder to future generations, we have to tell our children of this incredible deliverance. It's all about the next generation. It's all about, I want my kids, Dad, do you want, do you want us to be like you? I want you to be way better than me. And I want their kids to be way better than them. I want the anointing to increase as it moves along generations. The story of Esther is just practical. I don't do a lot of application. I don't do a lot of practicality. I'm more into interpretation. But nevertheless, this is straight up application and it's powerful. So let me share a few practical lessons from the story of Esther because if you'll be willing to see it, Esther and the story of Esther is exactly what's happening with Jews in the United States today. Okay, What people don't realize about the book of Esther is this is 483 B.C. They were exiled into Babylon at 607. Daniel looks at his watch and goes, hey, you prophesied 70 years we'd be back. To the day, 537, they go back. 537, the Jews were supposed to come back from the diaspora. What were they doing 483 in Persia? You know what they were doing in Persia? Because Jerusalem and Israel was decimated. It was rubble. It was raised to the ground. They're living like kings in Persia. They're living the high life. They're living good, man. They're partying. They got beautiful homes, great food. Why do they want to go back to the rubble? Guess what? It's the same thing today. Some of you get Jerusalem syndrome. You're like, oh, I would live here. You couldn't make it there a week. You were there on vacation. People were feeding you. They were cleaning your room. They were doing for you, driving you around, teaching you lessons. You were on vacation. Jerusalem's a tough place. While we were there, four people were shot and killed. It's a different ball game living there than vacationing there, guys. It's a whole different ball game. The Jews in the United States, they live in large. They live in large. Why do they want to go there? Their kids going to Ivy League schools are on the golf course. There's only one golf course in Israel. And it's like a miniature golf course. You know what it costs to live there? Jerusalem, a basic apartment, two by four is $3 million. One third of the people live below the poverty line and 60% of their money is spent on defense. It's a rough place. It's a rough place. But it mirror images what's going on today. You're at the precipice of Yeshua coming back. And like in the Garden of Eden, he said, you couldn't stay up for an hour? I think we sleep better than we pray. Okay. Lesson number one, let's take a look. Little sins can cause big problems. You can say it any way you want. Minor sins have major consequences. Any, anything that floats your boat. But nothing is small with God. Let me show you the Torah Pasha. Deuteronomy 25. Again, it, it's a little longer than usual because we had to play. We had Torah. If you've got to leave, you, you, really, you won't offend me. I'm a New York Jew, man. Just don't make fun of my mother. Everything else is, is fair game. Remember what Amalek did to you on the road as you were coming out of Egypt? How he met you on the road, attacked those in the rear. Why in the rear? That's where the old people are. That's where the infirmed are. That's where the weary are. He's a bully. He's a punk. Amalek was a punk. Who's Amalek? Grandson of who? Esau. Esau. Now, Haman isn't born yet. This is Deuteronomy. <laughs> Grandson of Esau. Those who were exhausted, straggling behind. They, te they tell you. The Bible tells you. You don't have to figure it out. He did not fear God. That's a problem right then and there. There's a lot of believers who don't fear God. You know, the cool churches today, you know what I mean? Coffee beans, big screens, 
God comes out with a big fat watch. He gives you a, a kindergarten lesson, 20 minutes, fill in the blank, and you sit there for 30 years and don't grow. It's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. They're treating you like you're in kindergarten. Crazy. It doesn't matter how much you know. You, you can know the word of the Lord, but not know the Lord of the word. It's about, we've got to bring back reverence, man. We have to bring back reverence. I don't call a cop Dave. I call him officer. I call a teacher Mr. and Mrs. I'm a rabbi. I, I give respect first. I don't expect it. I give it first. Everybody deserves respect. It's waning today. And if we don't respect what we do see, you're not going to respect what you don't see. You're just going to slap God on the back and say, what's up, pops, and throw your feet up on his desk and say, this is what I need. Man, that is so bad, guys. That is so sad. When I don't know your God has given you rest from all the enemies, Joshua, he didn't get the rest yet. He didn't get the rest. Judges, it was a whack show. Judges was nuts. They did what was right in their own sight. But there was a time when they got rest. When King Saul took over. That's when they got their rest. And they were supposed to blot out Amalek. And then he says, don't forget. So in this little Pasha, many moons ago, 1200 BC, the Lord's declaring perpetual war on Amalek because they ambushed and brutally attacked those children of Israel who left Egypt. You can read that in Exodus 17, 8 through 16. The Amalekites, Amalek, also joined the Canaanites and attacked Israel at Hormah, Numbers 14, 45. They were relentless. In Judges, they banded together with the Moabites. Judges 3, 13 attacked Israel. They banded together with the Midianites in Judges 6, 3 and attacked Israel and waged war. So you see, they were responsible for repeated destruction of Israel's land and, and food supplies. Israel was told not to forget to destroy them. Don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. What are you asking God questions about? What? You heard his voice, what's, what's to ask? And if you're not good with his voice, then go with the written word. What's there to ask? What's there to figure out? Just look, kingdom has what? How many syllables? Okay, you've got to figure out who's king and who's dumb. Okay, but they did forget. And let me tell you why this little sin, and it looks like a little sin, you'll see, was huge. Rabbi, Rabbi, God just told me to say something to this guy. Is that a big deal? If God tells you to do something, it's a big deal. See, in the world, we think, oh, that's little. Because we're always comparing. With everything's got to be supersized in the world, right? I have three cars. I have eight cars. I'm worth 100 million. He's worth 2.3 billion. That's the world, man. If God tells you to do something, it's not small. Me and Bernard, they went to do a test drive. The guy was this really good-looking young guy. You know, really good-looking, right? According to the world standards. Don't get me wrong. Everybody's good-looking because they're made in God's image. But this guy was worldly good-looking. Young, well-built. Looked like he had it all together. Well, God told me to tell him something. And I did. All I was supposed to tell him is God is real. Now, that sounds really trite and fortune cookie prophecy, right? At the end of the... the I just... I'm honest. I said, look, this is going to be weird for you probably. Okay, don't think it's so easy for me, but the more you do it, the less weird it is. Then it becomes very natural. The supernatural becomes natural. The natural becomes unnatural. So I just told him. I just told him. He starts wailing and weeping. His friend, who's filthy rich, who owns a construction company, paving in Las Vegas, living in a penthouse, worth $100 million, hung himself. He got on the side of his bed last night, and he said, God, I'm going to kill myself. You tell me if you're real. So you tell me that's not important. You save a life, you save an entire nation. Don't think when God tells you to do something, it's minor. God doesn't speak in a minor key. Look at Esther 3.1. It says, sometime later, King Ashurias, there was a year between Esther 2 and Esther 3, began to sing on Haman, the son of Hamdata, the Aga guy for advancement. Eventually, he gave him precedence over all his fellows. He was number two in more ways than one, but he was number two. That's a joke, okay? I keep forgetting you're not Jews. Jews would have been hysterical. Sorry, I forgot where I was. Haman is an Agagite. That's a title. His name was an Agag. Pharaoh's name was in Pharaoh. It's a royal title, you follow? King of the Amicalites. They were Agags. 
like the pharaohs of Egypt. Now, how did that happen? How was this guy birthed? They should have been destroyed 500 years earlier, right? He's a descendant from Amalek. If they were all destroyed, there would be no descendants from Amalek. So we got to go back 500 years to see how this happened. 1 Samuel 15, we just went back 500 years, okay? 1040 B.C. Shmuel, Samuel the prophet, said to Shaul, King Saul, Adonai sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now listen to what Adonai has to say. Good advice. Listen to what Adonai has to say. Here is what Adonai Tzavot, the Lord of Heaven's host, says. Powerful God. I remember what Amalek did to Israel. Wow. 200 years earlier. How they fought against Israel when they were coming out of Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and completely destroy everything they have. Don't spare them, but kill men and women, children and babies. I know this is hard for you to read, especially if you go to the New Wave Aftershave Church, because God is love. Okay, when Jesus comes back, you don't want to tell this to the Sunday school, he's coming back as a mass murderer, and the blood is going to be up to the bridle of the horse, and he has fire in his eyes and a sword in his mouth, and that's not good. You've got to tell the whole story. We preach God's love, and we forget God's holiness. It's like, well, we don't want to talk about that. You know, we've got to fill up the buckets, and we've got to fill up the seats, man. It's nickels and noses. I've got bills to pay. No, no. We're rolling in it, okay? God has blessed us. So I don't need to fill up any seats or the baskets. I just got to tell the truth. And wherever it lies, it lies. I'm free, man. I'm free. There's no fear, man. If you leave today and you never come back, I'm still here, man. You know what I'm saying? It's all about God. I play to an audience of one. You need to play to an audience of one. Kill men, women, children, and babies, cows and sheep, camels and donkey. So, to stop the spread, okay, of this abominable spiritual virus, this pandemic that the Amalekites were spewing, God told Saul to destroy the descendants of Esau. King Saul was not to spare anyone or anything. Let's see how he did. Verses 7 9. He attacked. He attacked Amalek, starting at Havilah. Where's that? northeast Mesopotamia, all the way to the border of Egypt. Took him out, man. He took Agag, the king of Amalek, alive. (laughs) Ivory soap is 99 and 44 hundredths pure. That makes it not pure. But he completely destroyed the people. Why did he take the king back? His show off. In those days, you know what they did? When, when there was a war in those days, in, in that culture, when they defeated a group of people, they defeated a land, they would bring the king back and put a collar on him and parade him on a leash. Then they would put him down on the ground. I mean, this is so rich. Follow me, if you follow nothing else. They put him down on the ground. They put their foot on the neck. They take his sword and they would cut a piece of his royal robe. And they would attach it to their robe. So the longer a king's robe was, the more powerful he was. Remember the prophet Isaiah? When he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple? Hello? You think that was in there for nothing? It's not my fault you're getting fill in the blanks. not my fault and I'm no great shakes there's guys that are scholars but you got to know this because the Bible is written by Jews to Jews in a Jewish place it's written Judaically Hebraically you got to know the culture however Saul and the people spared Agag along with the best of the sheep and cattle and even the second best <laughs> also the lambs and everything that was good he made the call They weren't inclined to destroy these things. I mean, God wouldn't want us to destroy these things. They're good. I mean, we could always sell them. A buck's a buck. No. Guys, you get saved and you got bad music. Don't sell it. Destroy it. Why are you going to give that crap to somebody else? Don't baptize it. Burn it. 
But everything that was worthless or weak, they completely destroyed. <laughs> Man, no matter what Saul was given to do, no matter what, he always fell short of complete obedience. Saul put everything to the sword except for the king and a few animals. It seems minor. It seems minor. If you read this, and I wasn't up here going nuts about it, you'd be like, oh, what's the big deal? It's just a king. He killed everybody else. I'll tell you what the big deal is. King Agag's offspring was Haman. And if Haman would have annihilated all the Jewish people, it would have thwarted God's plan of salvation. No Jews, no Jesus. No Jews, no Jesus. That, my friends, is major leak. Continuing on with Saul's story, 13 to 21. I just find this a little amusing. I don't mean to goof on him, but... Samuel went to Saul. Saul said to him, May I don't know I bless you. What a kiss up. Just for the record, yours truly couldn't tell a kiss up from a mile away. That's why, you know who Max is when he's in the front lawn of our house? He's lawn boy. And Bernadette cleans the house on Shabbat. And Lily pitches in. That's why they, wanna, that's why they went away to school. I just worked them to death. I mean, the dependency exemption on my tax return isn't enough. Free labor. Free labor. So he says, Adonai bless you, prophet. I have done what Adonai ordered. Really? But Samuel answered, if so, why do I hear sheep bleeding and cows mooing and phones ringing? <laughs> Shut it off. Saul said they brought them from the Amalekai. Because people spared the best of the sheep and cattle only to sacrifice to God. God doesn't want your stinking sacrifices. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He wants your obedience. But we completely destroyed the rest. I mean, is this crazy? Then Samuel said to Shaul, Stop! I'm going to tell you what Adonai said to me last night. Speak, prophet. Speak, let's continue. Samuel then said, you may be small in your own sight, but you are head of the tribes of Israel. Guys, you may be small in your own sight. I don't know who told you that. I don't know where you got off thinking that you're small in your own sight. You are representing the king of kings. You are ambassador from the kingdom of heaven. You are representing the king of kings. Jesus has left the building. Non-believers don't know who he is. They're only going to see him through you. And when you represent him stinky, then he looks stinky. Amen. Why did you seize the spoil instead of paying attention to what Adonai said? From Adonai's viewpoint, you have done an evil thing. You didn't just mess up. It's evil. Disobedience is evil. Wow, Rabbi, that's harsh. What can I tell you? I didn't write it. Next couple of verses. Shaul said to Samuel, I did too pay attention instead of, see the difference between him and David? When Nathan came and told him the story, he said, I'm the man. I sinned against God. He wouldn't, he, all he had to do was repent. All we have to do is repent. All the world has to do is repent. But we're too darn proud. Why should we admit we're wrong? Let's blame it on our grandmother. Blame it on Biden. Blame it on Trump. Blame it on the whites. Blame it on the blacks. Blame it on the, the, the vaccine. Blame it on Rio. I don't know. Somebody's got to take the blame. I'm not taking the responsibility. And this is an old game. This is from Genesis 3. Adam, what have you done? It's not my bed. It was the woman. And by the way, you gave it to me. That's what he said. Hey, relax, girls. What do you want from a rib? You know what I mean? You know that one, don't you? There was another story that's very popular in the oral law of Judaism where Adam is in the garden and he says, it's not good for you to be alone, which is Genesis 2.16, which is accurate. And he said, I'm going to give you a woman, flesh from your flesh. What, what's a woman? She's going to be a helpmate to you. What is she going to do? She's going to cook for you. She's going to clean for you. She's going to darn for you. She's going to take care of your every need. Your desires will be fulfilled in her. Adam said, what's that going to cost me? He said, no, I'm in a leg. And he said, okay, then what can I get for a rib? 
You're welcome. Obviously, you've been here for a while, right? Tell some of those Gentiles. It's actually funny. It's okay. Some of you guys would have laughed, but your wives are here, right? I get it. Honey, can I laugh? Yes, you can laugh. It's funny. Um, I'm sorry. I, I offended some women. I know feminism is a big deal today, right? So I might have offended you guys, some of you women. Okay, I'll help you out. What do you call a handsome, wealthy, God-fearing, compassionate man? A fantasy. <laughs> but the people took some of the spoil, the best of the sheep, and on and on and on. Saul was never short of excuses. He was constantly redefining the Lord's commands, doing what seemed best to him rather than what God said was best. Obedience to me is like being pregnant. Either you are or you're not. You can't go, Mom, I'm just a little pregnant. No. You either are or you're not. Okay? Either he's the Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. One or the other. Last verse for that lesson, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel said, does Adam really take as much pleasure in burnt offerings? Do you know why sometimes people do a lot for God? Because they're trying to alleviate the guilt of their sin. That's not the way to do it. Does he, does he desire in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying? Surely obedience is better than sacrifice, right? Heating oil is better than the fat of rams. This is one of the classics in the Word of God. I'm not just talking about the Old Testament. I'm talking about the whole Word of God. You know what this means? Obedience first, obedience last, obedience in between. Next lesson. God's the boss. Some people call it sovereignty. All I know is he's the boss. And I should know about bosses because I've been fired of every job I've ever had except for this one. <laughs> Finally found something I could get, get by with. Okay, if, you, if some of you are, went to Bible college and some of you are really have a high IQ, right? God is sovereign and omnisciently directing the universe. Does that stroke your intellect? God's the boss. God's the boss. Esther 3, 2, 5, and 6 is what it says. All the king's servants at the king's gate would kneel and bow before Haman because the king had so ordered. The king ordered. But Mordecai would neither kneel or bow down to him. Haman was furious when he saw that Mordecai was not kneeling and bowing to him. However, on learning what people Mordecai belonged to, it seemed to him a waste to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Rather, he decided to destroy all Mordecai's people. Look, your enemy doesn't have a social security number. Okay, I'm not mad at Haman. Haman was operating in the spirit of the Antichrist. Hear me. The greatest deception... You, we got the King of Kings, we got the Lord of Lords, we got the Song of Songs. Let me tell you the deception of deceptions. In the last day, it's going to get hot and heavy for Israel. All the nations are going to surround her. So says the prophet Zechariah. That means America too. So you're going to feel like Daniel in Babylon. If you don't side with the Jewish people, you could love Jesus all day long. You're done messed up. You're done messed up. Trust me when I tell you that. Because to not love the Jewish people is operating in the spirit of the Antichrist. And we'll go over this next week. Do I want you to love them because I'm Jewish? Heck no. I don't love them because I'm Jewish. I love them because they gave us monotheism, they gave us the Bible, and they gave us Yeshua. I mean, if it was from the Swedes, I'd be eating Swedish meatballs all day long. Which, by the way, I don't like because I don't like sweet meat. But anyway, that's neither here nor there, is it? Can you tell I have ADD, sir? Do you know what ADD is, by the way? It's attention deficit. That's a really nice tie you got. <laughs> you don't have to be a doctor to understand that joke, right? But it helps. It helps having a medical background. Thank you. Under the influence of the spirit of the Antichrist, Haman declares, kill all the Jews. This is not Haman's battle cry. It's Satan's. Don't you remember? Didn't Satan try to kill all the boys in Egypt? Why? No boys, no seed. No seed, no Jews. That didn't work. Remember when Yeshua was born? Didn't he kill all the boys again? I'm going to kill whoever that Messiah is. He's got to die because if he grows up, he dies for the sins of the world. And then he tried to prevent them from rising. And then he tried to hold his ankles from ascending. Now what's his, what's his play? I'm going to prevent them from coming back. You ain't going to prevent them from coming back. Because my people every day more and more are saying, Baruch Baba Shem Anoy. And that's one more Baruch Baba Shem Anoy that's bringing him home. As to 3 7, I'm going to fly through this, sorry. In the first month, the month of Nisan, that's the first month of God's biblical calendar. It's not January. In the 12th year of Ashvirus, they began throwing pure, 
lots. Okay, to find out what day. What day are we going to kill all the Jews? So in the days of antiquity, going back to 483 B.C., even to the time of Pentecost, the casting of Lot was the legitimate way of determining the will of God. By a seeming coincidence, just a coinky dinky the date indicated was a year away. It's April, Nisan. And they pick Adar 12 months later to what? Give Jews some time. Brilliant. Brilliant. How did, how did that happen, Rabbi? How, how could that happen? It's just rolling dice, right? It's just chance. It's just probability. Is it? That's not what my Bible says. Proverbs 16.33 says this. One can cast lots, you can roll the dice, but the decision comes from the Lord. Now, don't go to Vegas and then blow on the dice and say a prayer and shoot them. That's not what I'm talking about here. So roll the dice, go ahead. But God's going to determine how they land. Rabbi, what if the reigning king is absolutely bent on evil? What if, what if he's bent on evil? No worries. Doesn't matter. Another proverb. Proverb 21.1. The king's heart is in Adonai's hand. It's like streams of water. He directs it wherever he pleases. Are you kidding me? The Lord can overrule a king's thoughts and actions? Read, read the Bible, man. Tons of kings were overruled. Rabbi, are you sure? Yes. How do you know? One more proverb. Last one. Proverb 21.30. No wisdom discernment or counsel succeeds against Adonai. Man is powerless. Doubt smart God when it comes to wisdom, understanding, or strategy. No plans, no plan shall avail against the Lord. The Lord is God. Man's plans. Good. Lesson three. Put some legs on your prayers. For you theologians, divine providence doesn't negate human responsibility. A.K.A. do something. Stop complaining. Stop talking about the state of the union. Stop getting on the internet. What are you doing? You're accomplishing nothing. The only people that are listening to you is a nut like you. You're not winning anybody to the other side. You're just on your little soapbox so you can feel good about yourself. I've got 216 followers on my YouTube channel. Wow, you're changing the world. Shine your light, spread your salt, save us all. Stop it, man. You're wasting your time. And you're just getting aggravated. Don't you feel dirty after you get into an argument on, with somebody on the internet? I'm not on. I don't know. But I would assume you feel a little dirty. Why do you do that? Why do you do that? Crazy. Crazy. Esther 2, 19, 21, 23. When the girls would gather on other occasions, Mordecai would sit at the king's gate. He was concerned about his cousin. He raised her. I mean, these are normal people. Guys, these people are just like you and me. There's nothing new under the sun. They had issues in their marriages. They had health issues. They had insecurity issues. They're just like you and me. Just like you and me. Just like you and me. Just as dysfunctional. He was worried about the little girl. So he'd sit at the king's gate, and he overheard this plot. And just by chance, he was in the right place at the right time. Just by coincidence. Another coincidence, right? The Bible's full of coincidences. Isn't it wild? Almost, maybe they're not coincidences. Maybe they're actually God incidences. Maybe coincidence is just God deciding to remain anonymous. Because he doesn't need a pat on the back. He knows who he is. And if he forgets, right now you got 24, you know, 24 that are bowing down and casting their crowns. And you got four living creatures going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So I don't think he's going to forget. So, he heard what happened. Now, he could have prayed. Oh, Lord, make it known. Nope. He didn't pray. What did he do? Took action. He did something. Faith without works isn't faith at all. It isn't faith. Faith produces the works. Works evidence the faith. There's no evidence of your faith if you don't do anything. It gets a lot quiet when I preach. But still, he had to act. He had to act. 4, 10, 11, he does act. Esther spoke to Hatach and gave him the message for Mordecai. And she tells him, listen, it's a, it's a rough situation. I can't just go in there, cuz. I mean, he'll kill me. You want to save your own skin. I understand. I'm not, I'm not belittling her. I'm not assailing her. I get it. 
It's a capital offense unless he extends the golden scepter. What makes it doubly dangerous is he hasn't summoned her for 30 days. Maybe she's not his number one anymore. I mean, he had a harem. Bottom line is it's not looking really great for Esther. 12 through 14, you know this because, boy, have we abused this verse, huh? You know? Maxie, I need to wash my car. But, Dad, I'm busy. Perhaps you were born for such a time as this. <laughs> he washed it yesterday. <laughs> Upon being told what Esther had said, Mordecai asked them to give Esther this answer. Don't suppose that merely because you happen to be in the royal palace, you will escape any more than the other Jews. For if you fail to speak up now, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from a different... How does evil prosper? Just good people doing nothing. We live in a world today where there's a ton of good people doing absolutely nothing. That's how it happens. That's how it proliferates. Just do nothing. Or wait for the next guy to do something. Surely somebody else will stop. I'm in a hurry. Come on, S.E., speak up. Why? Because you won't escape. When the Jews are slain, they find out you're a Jew, you're done. Even if you're the queen, you're done. Look how he treated Vashti. If she refuses to act now, somebody else will arise. God's plan will not be thwarted, but she'll perish. In a practical sense, every believer has a role to play in God's plan. you just got to figure out your role. 15, 16, Esther returns and sends an answer to Mordecai. Go assemble all the Jews. She's going to go for it. Fast for three days and three nights. Everybody. Everybody fast. Fasting is a lever too. It's like, God, I mean business. I need, a, I need an answer to this prayer. Does God need you to fast? You need to fast. Does God you need to pray? You need to pray. You need to know what's going on in your life and what you need. God knows already before you ask. And she says the famous line, if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish, means even though her danger seemed great and the outcome seemed uncertain, she still went before the king. There was a famous uh, guy, uh, an actor. Um, what the heck was his name? Cowboy movies? Help me out. John Wayne. John Wayne, sorry. I, I forgot for a minute. But he said, courage is when you're shaking in your boots and you still mount your horse. It's okay to be shaking in your boots. It's understandable. This is scary, man. When we as believers go through difficult and trying circumstances, we can approach the throne of grace because Yeshua is God's golden scepter that was stretched out at Golgotha. Can somebody up in here shout hallelujah, please? I mean, I know I'm out of my mind, but I really thought I lost it because I thought this was a painting I was talking to. Number four, reverse the curse. That's what God does. I call it the divine boomerang effect. Esther 7 9 through 10, we'll go through this quick. Harvana, one of the king's attendants, said, look, the gallows, 70 feet high. The king said, hang Haman on it. So, Haman took Mordecai's place on the gallows. Reverse, two points. Esther 8, 1 through 2. That same day, King Ashverus gave the house of Haman and the enemy of the Jews to Esther the queen. Also, Mordecai appeared before the king for Esther, had revealed his relationship. The king removed his signet ring and had taken it back from Haman. The same thing happened with Joseph, no? This isn't anything new. Man proposes, God disposes. So make your plans. Remember there was a famous guy, a famous Jewish rabbi that said tomorrow has enough worries for itself. Just take care of today. Live in the day. You don't have to go to AA to know one day at a time. you got no control over tomorrow. You barely have a control over today. Live for today. Haman's house was given to Esther. Haman's position was given to Mordecai. Reverse, two points. 8, 15, 16. Meanwhile, Mordecai left the king's presence, arrayed in royal blue and white, wearing a large gold crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. Mordecai left his sackcloth for robes of splendor. And the Jewish people went from potential decimation to flagrant celebration. Reverse, two points. Esther 9, 1 through 2. We're almost home. The time approached for the king's order and decree to be carried out. That day, the enemies of the Jews hoped to overpower them. But as it turned out, the opposite took place. <laughs> Instead of the Jewish people becoming victims, they became victorious. Reverse, two points. 9 20, 22, Mordecai recorded these events and sent letters to all the Jews in all the provinces of King Ashaviris, instructing them to observe the 14th day of the month of Adar. That's going to be Tuesday night. And the 15th day, 
That's going to be Wednesday to commemorate the days on which the Jews obtained rest. They went from sorrow into gladness, mourning into a holiday. Sounds Psalm 30-ish, right? Changed my mourning into dancing. The Jewish people went from sorrow to gladness, mourning to joy, from wailing to whirling. Reverse. Two points. Last verses on New Testament reading. It ties in beautifully. The serpent. Who's the serpent? Satan. Spewed water like a river out of his mouth after the woman. Who's the woman? Israel. Israel. Always. Always. In order to sweep her away in the flood... But the land came to her rescue. I wonder how that happened. In the beginning, God created. It opened its mouth and swallowed up the river which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. I tell people, they go, Rabbi, is the Kidron Valley really going to split? There's a fault line. Seismologists found a fault line. I wonder who put that there. The dragon was infuriated over the women and went off to fight the rest of her children. Who are her children? Those who obey God's commands, not those who make a profession. Nope. Professions mean nothing if you don't back it up. Those who obey God's commands and bear witness to Yeshua. I told you, it's a lost art. We don't do it anymore. I don't know what happened. I I just don't know. I just don't know. It's crazy. In an effort to foil Israel's escape, The serpent causes a great flood to follow the people, but an earthquake swallows the water and the devil is outwitted. Reverse, two points. Furious over this humiliation, the enemy seeks to wreak vengeance on the Jews who had remained in the land and who showed the reality of their faith by keeping the commandments of God during the tribulation. And I'm not going to get into when um, the body of believers is going to float out, but you need to read your Bible. You just believe what you were told with no backing up of Scripture whatsoever, which is lunacy. Let's just leave it at that for today. Maybe I'll go over that next week. Furious over the humiliation, the enemy wants to nail all the Jews. Those who bear witness to Yeshua, those who, but what does that mean? That is all who persevere in faithfulness and obedience to the gospel while under persistent attack of Satan. Some of you tell me, Rabbi, I'm under persistent attack. You don't think this big mouth is under persistent attack? What, what, what? I, was, I was a vegan before anybody knew the term. I was a highly competitive triathlete, winning triathlons. I ate perfectly, didn't drink, didn't smoke, and I have eight aneurysms. You don't think I'm under attack? You know what? I'm glad that I'm attack worthy. And the song remains the same. The devil hates the Jews, and for obvious reasons, monotheism, the oracles of God, the Bible, and Yeshua, first and second coming. First and second coming. How do I know that? Because in Matthew 23 and 24, he says, you will not see me again until you say, Jews are bringing him back. They brought him here, they're bringing him back here. He's the king of Israel. Make no mistake. So let's conclude our time together with three big hallelujahs. Ready? Anti-Semitism is a well-worn path that leads to the destruction of its traveler. Pharaoh, Haman, Antiochus, Hitler, Arafat, Khomeini, Gaddafi, or Hussein. They all paid a price for cursing Israel and the Jewish people. Today, this Antichrist spirit runs deep within Hamas, the Taliban, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the entire Islamic Republic of Iran. In the last days, the nations of the world will be the enemies of God. Our deliverer won't be Moses. Our deliverer won't be Mordecai, and it won't be the Maccabees. Our deliverer will be none other than Messiah Yeshua himself. Hallelujah. Number two, the message of Purim should not be limited to the Jewish people nor the history of Israel. God's covenantal relationship with Israel confirms to all believers that no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation, God will never leave us nor forsake us. He loves us with an everlasting love, and because the Lord has never turned his back on Israel, then we, as new covenant believers, grafted into the commonwealth of Israel, can be totally secure that he will never turn his back on us either. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last hallelujah, and you're free to go. Last but not least, there is a certain feature to the book of Esther that has troubled Jewish people as well as Christian readers alike. There's no mention of God. This is true. However... You have to understand that God is the author of all history, even if he doesn't sign his name at the bottom of every page. Even if God's name is not explicitly associated with those who voluntarily stayed in Babylon instead of returning to the land, his care for them cannot be denied. I'm so glad that you guys aren't God because you would have blew me up a long time ago. You know who you are. 
They were still his people and they would still protect them. So although God may appear to be invisible at times, our God is invincible all the time. I am so thankful that King Ashaviras couldn't sleep that night, but I am all the more thankful that the King of Kings never sleeps nor slumbers. <laughs> Hallelujah, number three. Let's stand together. I think there's a big carnival. You're all welcome. We've got some real food. Um, you're welcome to stay and hang out. And um, hopefully, Lord willing, I'll see some of you at the famous masquerade ball tomorrow night, huh? I'm actually going actually gonna to go out with you guys and partake. But I'm, I'm here to tell you up front, if you ask me a question about Revelation, I'm going to sock you. I'm telling you. <laughs> I will sock you. I don't even care if it's Judy Shockley. I've never hit a woman. I'm going to hit you, Judy, if you ask me. <laughs> I, I want to just go out with you guys and have a good time, right? You guys have a good time. Why can't I? Fair? Yeah. Great. You guys are all witness to what I said, right? <laughs> okay. I love you. I love you more than you know. I'm so proud of you. You should hear how I talk to other rabbis in Israel about you guys. You should only know. You should only know. Am I hard on you? Yeah, I expect a lot. Because if you put the bar here, nobody's going to make it to the bar. So do I raise the bar high? Didn't you sure? Aren't we supposed to be like him? That's a pretty high bar. So I push you. I push my kids. I want you to push me too. But when we fall, let's be there to catch each other. We're family, man. We don't compete. My kids never fought with each other. You'll see them surfing, holding hands. They weren't allowed to. I raised them. Your family. Everybody's against us. Some, the world is against us. The world system is against us. Sometimes the church is going to be against us. We will not be against each other. We're not turning our swords on each other. Okay? You're going to love each other whether you like it or not. And, and now that they're older, they hang out. My two oldest live a block away from each other in New York City. They hang out all the time. Watch TV, go out shopping. It's a beautiful thing. Max and Lily now are tight, because he was tight with Shay. And as a family, when we get together, it's love personified. Just indoctrinate them in that. You know what I mean? No matter how many times you cut out somebody's legs, it ain't going to make you any taller. We're all struggling. We've all got stuff going on. Everybody's got issues. There's so many issues in this room now, and most of them are unspoken. But why can't the body of believers strengthen each other and encourage each other and actually love each other? Remember, there was a rabbi who said, they're not going to know you by how much scripture you know. They're not going to know you by how much eschatology. The book of Revelation wasn't written until 90. So guess what? The first century believers didn't even know about it. They're not going to know you because you throw a fish on the back of your car or you send your kids to vacation Bible school. You're in church Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. They're going to know you if you love each other. So let's make sure that they know us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Adonai, Vayishmarecha, Yivarecha Adonai Ponovilecha, Vihunecha, Yisar Adonai Ponovilecha, Vyasem Lecha, Shalom. It's an honor to be a rabbi. I love you. God bless you. Chag Sameach. Happy Purim.